this is a, an inordinately long title, which, which maybe you can forgive me for making it up because it was right during the middle of term when I had to make up this title. Um, what I'm really going to talk about is uh, disruptive types of numerical methods for climate and weather prediction. Um, I've put on the slide, too, my principal collaborators in all of the work that I'm gonna, going to show you. Some of the work was done at Los Alamos National Laboratory while I was still there with Terry Hout, who was a postdoc then, but now he's a staff member, and Jared Whitehead, who's now an assistant professor at Brigham Young University. And there's also now Adam Peddle, who is a PhD student, and Pedro Pejoto from University of Sao Paulo, who was visiting Exeter last year, and Martin Schreiber, um, who is a proleptic lecturer at the University of Exeter, too. So, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to, I'm more of an oceanographer than um, an atmospheric scientist, often uh, talks about high performance computing have to do with the atmosphere, but this time we're going to see some things in the ocean. Um, there are, so I'm going to try to give you a feel for the sorts of models that ocean and climate models are. Um, because of, you know, you, you saw Mark's talk and probably everyone in this room knows about these shift in architectures anyway, but there's all kinds of projects going on worldwide to address the issue of the architecture change. In the US, DOE, for example, there's the ACME project. I wish I could remember what all these acronyms are, but there's also the ESCAPE project, um, uh, which is a Horizon 2020 project, and, and many others. But I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about what Peter was just alluding to, which is this issue with the time step limit and what the implications of this time step limit uh, um, might be for the situation we find ourselves in where instead of getting speed-ups through processor speed, we're getting them through more parallelism. So then I'm going to do a friendly introduction to time parallelism, and then I'm going to give you two um, examples of results, one with parareal, which I will explain, the other with um, a very parallel matrix exponential, or um, exponential integrator. And then I'm going to give you uh, some of my final thoughts, which is the nature of this possible step change in the way we view these types of simulations for climate and weather if we're going to address the changing architectures. Okay, so I thought I would start out with some some nice color pictures <laughs> of the ocean. So on the lower left are uh, results from the NEMO model, which is the ocean component of the Hadley Center's climate model. And there are three panels that represent three different resolutions. Um, and you can see, so the, the type of resolution that are, that's used in climate models is on the right, so it's the global ocean, but there are three resolutions shown. And you can see that the, the speed, I think this is the speed, is um, really smeared out. Uh, but it, the center panel is a moderate resolution, and on the left is a very high resolution, which really can't be achieved for climate scale models. Um, but you can see that there's all kinds of eddy activity, and I'll explain why that's important in just a minute. Uh, the figure in the upper right is a measure of the eddies in the Arctic Ocean. So if you're looking down on the top of the Arctic Ocean, which is one of my main fluid dynamical interests now, um, you can see that it's populated also with many eddies. So eddies are, are everywhere in the ocean and at all depths. And on the left, I'm showing you a slice through, a vertical slice through the Arctic. This is data from the Beaufort Gyre Exploration Program, and on the left is a, a vertical slice. Uh, it's the temp potential temperature and the vertical axis and time. So it's something hanging there underneath the ice, and it's measuring what the temperature and salinity is, but right next to it is the speed, 
And what you're seeing on the right are these really interesting columnar vortices which fill up the depths of the Arctic Ocean. And these vortices, they're going at like 30 centimeters per second, which is super fast uh, for the ocean. And is so, they're so powerful, they can take out the instrument arrays. And on the lower right, this is um, the potential temperature. It's the global potential temperature from a one-tenth degree pop model. The pop model is the model I used to use at Los Alamos, which is the ocean component of the NCAR uh, community Earth system model, for example. So these are the types of models eventually you know, we want to use for, for climate prediction. Um, so one of the points I want to make before I get on to high-performance computing issues of these kinds of models in the atmosphere too, the, the contributions to their accuracy are made equally through the physical model as they are through numerical improvements, sometimes more so. So I'm sh what I'm showing in this slide the color pictures on the upper left, on the left, once again, is the type of resolution you expect in a climate model, and on the right is a um, one-tenth degree resolution. This is just of, in the Southern Ocean, there's one current that goes all the way around the Earth called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and the resolution that we're trying to get to, it's called the deformation radius scale, and that's because an important process happens there. It's not the dissipative scale as it is in, say, Navier-Stokes. We're after this deformation scale. This is where this powerful transformation of potential energy, so the sun shines on the equator and it's cold at the pole, and this temperature gradient gets rectified during this process of baroclinic instability, and that converts eddies to to um, stratification, which, you know, is like the temperature, the vertical temperature gradient. So, one of the, well, I think arguably the most important change to the ocean model in the last 20, 25 years was an improvement in the physical model, which allowed us to feel the effects of baroclinic instability without resolving this deformation radius so that we could get the stratification right in the ocean without having the resolution of the eddy. So this was a physics strategy, not a, um, not a numerical one. And so the, the models are really tightly coupled. So let, I, I, I'll just point out what these models are. So, so there's physics models in climate models. They're for clouds, land processes, there's even models for trees. These models are sometimes algorithms. So here's, as, as an example of a simple model for rain, if humidity greater than 100%, then rain. So it's difficult to um, write down the mathematics of some of these models because they're so complex. So, because they're so complex. And therefore, when you're designing an algorithm, it's hard to pull apart the parts of the model that are from physics and parts of the model that are from the partial differential equation, for example. There's also often data assimilation in the solution, so actual data is integrated into the time evolution of the solution, especially for numerical weather prediction. So this also makes it difficult for us to guess or even write down <laughs> equations for what the, time, the actual time evolution will be. Um, the other concept that I think is important is that um, uh, is what is, a, what is a grid convergence study? You can certainly increase the grid spacing, but it isn't meaningful for the ocean or the atmosphere just by itself because in the example I just gave you with this physics model that allowed us to do the ocean calculations, if you were to go up another, increase the number of grid points, a substantial amount, suddenly you would be resolving the eddies, and you, so you wouldn't use this physical model. So as you 
increase the number of grid points, you take away models or introduce new ones, physics models. So the notion of grid convergence, the, the solutions are um, this, they're, they're, uh, judged to be good by their statistical convergence to data. And it's not just, it's not just a simple matter, matter of doubling your grid space and seeing um, how your solution looks anymore. So climate and weather models are really complex fusions of numerics and physics, which makes them difficult to work with for high-performance computing. So now on to the new architectures. Um, I'm putting this slide up. Mark gave this really excellent talk about what's coming in the future, but this was a plot from the Department of Energy, a figure from the department, it's a cartoon really, that, um, that was really eye-opening to me because when Los Alamos, let's see, they got, they got, um, they got a, a machine that had, I think, FPGAs on them, and uh, I was like, what are you guys thinking? You know, I can't do anything with this. <laughs> um, but when I understood that, you know, I wasn't really going to have a choice, that the power constraints were the limiting factor, and if I didn't take some action, I would be running at the same grid resolution I have now. You know, that was, that was one of my many oh-no moments when I was finding out about what was coming um, in the, for computers. Okay, so my other oh-no moment came when I was learning CUDA, um, and I was learning how to make best use of the GPU, and I finally understood the degree to which my computer science colleagues meant parallel, data parallel. So I've given an, I've given an uh, example on the left and right. On the left is a, two instructions that are data independent. So that means the second instruction does not depend on the first one at all. And on the right, which is something that I'm used to doing, you know, with wild abandon in any of my codes, is the second instruction depends on the one that came before it. And if you really want to uh, make use of the GPUs, you need to be throwing things at them that are really data parallel. So, so you know, million, billion way parallelism. You know, I was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> um, okay, so now I'm going to move on. I've, I've told you now about the ocean and what I see is the changes in the architectures. Now I'm going to tell you about the types of mathematical stiffness that exist in the PDEs themselves that sort of stand in the way of us getting or achieving more parallelism than we have now. I uh, kind of view our climate models as, you know, they're like dish rags that have been the water has been wrung out of them, the, the parallelism has been wrung out over the last 20 years, and there's plenty of things we can do to improve that, but there are issues because of the dissipative and oscillatory stiffness. That I'm going to describe those in more detail in just a minute. But basically, if you have a fixed grid, like a fixed grid, um, a coarse grid like I showed you, or a fine one for the ocean, those have been basically optimized for parallel in space. If you were to add more processors, you would do too much communicating, for example. So there's really not a lot more to be had that way. Um, if you then say, okay, well, I can do grid refinement, you increase the number of grid points, you can do that as much as you want, you can then increase the number of processors you use, but the more you increase the number of grid points, the smaller your time scale, time step has to be. So you can wind up waiting a long time for a simulation to finish. There must be um, a computer science concept that says there's a certain footprint on any parallel machine. But you can see that there's a footprint of our climate models in terms of how much spatial parallelism there is and how long we wait for the solution. And that's going to be finite. So, there, and right now there's no way of getting around this. And so I want to show you this. This is this 
This, this limitation in the number of processors we can use, this is from a paper. Martin Schreiber is the lead author on this. It's just submitted to the International Journal of High Performance Computing, and I'm going to be talking more about some of these results in a minute. But uh, these is just, this is just the solution to the linear rotating shallow water equations, which is one of our fundamental models that we look at that's uh, used as a benchmark for developing dynamical cores. And for finite differences, and this is just simple finite differences, nothing that sophisticated, you can see that there's three grid resolutions and that the curve, so this is scalability, always peaks off. So you can add as you can add processors, but they'll just you know sit there idle. There'll be no more performance gains. So that this is this is what we're facing. You know the 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 world is ready to learn things about what might happen regionally it's, uh, with climate change, but if we, don't do, if we don't figure out some way to deal with this problem, then we'll have what we have now. Maybe we'll have more ensemble averages or things like that, but we're going to be limited in what we can do. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce you to uh, some disruptive algorithms in particular, time parallelism. And it's called disruptive because you can't just put it into the model we have today. The difficulties associated with time parallelism are such that if you were to just take an ocean model or even an atmosphere model and apply it, you wouldn't see much speed up because those models, as I described earlier, are so complex. And people have tried to do this already. And so I was the uh, reviewer of at least two papers that I'm sure didn't get published, which were t attempting to do this. There was a successful ocean paper published in the International Journal of Numerical Methods and Fluids, uh, which did time parallelism, but with very, very modest success, I'll say. So, so these are really, a, these types of algorithms are a big change to what we, what we use now. So here's just a cartoon that shows you the notion of time parallelism. So on the left, the, the, this, this is like the number of processors, and it's divided into four sections, and this is what we would call spatial parallelism. So one of those, one of those panels is an entire model, but, but there are then many of them. So you do many, many time instantiations of the entire model at the same time. On the right, I have um, a picture of time parallel only. So you would fit the model on an entire core by itself and just do model, different model instantiations like, like that. So when I first heard about this, and so I study ocean turbulence, I thought, oh, this will never work. And then, you know, then I was reviewing papers in which it clearly wasn't going to work. Um, but in fact, uh, parallel in time is 50 years old, at least. Um, I'm going to advertise Martin Gander's fantastic paper called 50 Years of Time Parallel Time Integration, in which he overviews some of the latest research in this area. And I put a list of the main types of topics that are covered. There's an international workshop on parallel and time methods. The next one will be in 2017 in Canada. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples of these today, but I'm by no means going to cover what's already well understood. There are theorems about how these methods work and everything. So this, this really isn't new, but it's certainly new for climate and weather prediction. So the first one is re called RIDIC the Revisionist Integral Deferred Correction, and I'm going to explain that one a little bit because I think we haven't taken as much advantage of these kinds of ideas as we could. There are shooting-type methods, including parareal, which I'm going to discuss in more detail in just a, in a, just a minute. There are multi-grid-type methods. A key paper for that is Emmett and Minion, 2012. Parallel matrix integrators, um, and any of these methods can come in iterative and direct forms. So here's an example of RIDIC, and 
And um, the key papers for this I've listed uh, in blue on the slide. What you can think of this is when you have a multi-stage construction for a time integrator, what you do is you do the low accurate thing on the first step, and then as you take the next time step at a low accuracy concurrently, you take the correction step to the first time step that you just had. So this helps you get parallel speedups if you're using a high accurate integrator. But if you're using a low accuracy one with just two stages, um, it doesn't do you much good. But the notion of doing staged computations it, more often than we do now, I think that could be a good one. So here's another example of parallel in time, or parareal. So this is often termed pint, but in the United Kingdom we like to call it pint. Um, the, the first paper was back in the 60s, uh, and then there was a really important paper that um, changed the game for this, I'm not sure anybody even knew about Nevergelt's 1964 paper, but Leon Made and Ternici um, wrote this key paper, um, but a really good friendly introduction to this type of thinking can be found um, on the Newton Institute website. It's a talk by Jean Coté from Medio Canada uh, under the AMM program in September of 2012, there's a video of him introducing Parareal for really simple problems. Um, and his, his work on this definitely convinced me that I shouldn't do this. Uh, so let me explain this figure to you. So the, the notion of Parareal, so consider the black dots first is to take many large time steps with some cheap, what was called a coarse integrator. Then, um, in between each of these big time steps, you start an independent solution where you, where you use tiny time steps. And the, w the reason you get parallelism out of this is because they all go off at the same time. So this is a key concept in this talk. So I'll say it again that you take the big time step using a coarse, cheap method, many of them, you know, a thousand. And then in between each of the coarse time steps, you take fine time steps. At the big black points, you then take the final solution that's accurate from the fine time integration, and you do an incomplete Newton iteration, and then you have another iteration where you take that solution and advance it with the cheap course time step. Now for this, for this uh, algorithm, there exists theorems. There's a really great paper about this um, gander and hair that you can just download off the web called Nonlinear Convergence Analysis of the Parareal Method. Um, so if, if your course solver is cheap, and if you can take many big time steps, and if the ratio of the big time step to the small ones is large, then you can find pretty significant parallel speedups with this method. But there were a lot of ifs in there. So that the two types of mathematical problems that can be realized with parareal method are from dissipative stiffness, and I have an image of that on the right, and oscillatory stiffness on the left. So um, the, the, the dissipative stiffness um, is a slow singular limit, and really, since, since uh, the Taylor series is such a foundational part of numerics, you can see what happens here is, for dissipative stiffness, you can do a pretty accurate you can make pretty good use of a Taylor series expansion for dissipative stiffness. And if you think of, think of mathematical solutions as the dissipation coefficient um, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, then 
you get something called a slow singular limit of the PDE. And what that means is that there's a slow or long time solution that is completely decoupled from the fast time scale or the spin-up. And people have made good use of this with parareal for doing um, parareal calculations with dissipative stiffness. For oscillatory stiffness, you can see if you just are applying the Taylor series at any any time, it could be giving you the wrong direction of the way the flow is going. So you're still, you're still sort of limited for accuracy to be in between what those oscillations are. This, in mathematics, is called a fast singular limit. And what happens is the, the slow dynamics does not completely decouple from the fast. The, the, you can show that the slow dynamics is independent of the fast, but the fast dynamics is always there and gets swept by the slow. And this is the type of stiff... So we have both types of stiffness in climate, but it's this oscillatory stiffness that's, I think, really kind of standing in our way of making good use of this. Now, so should we apply um, PINT to the climate models that we have? And I've just told you that these models are so complex, and in, there's already at least two unpublished papers on the topic that shows almost no parallel speedups. And I think I've con I hope that I've convinced you that the models are so complex; they're actually physical and numerical models that we really can't separate out these two pro these two mathematical issues that contribute to convergence for parareal. Um, even in the splitting, so in the ocean, there is a type of splitting in which you have a slow, three-dimensional dynamics, and, and then you have a faster depth-integrated dynamics. And in the ocean community, we think of the 2D thing as fast, and the 3D thing as slow, because this is, this is going to sound complicated, but the fast dynamics of the 3D thing is slower than the fast dynamics of the 2D thing. <laughs> but both of these have fast and slow dynamics in them. So it's not a complete, it's, it's not a complete splitting even just for the PD. It's not, a complete way, it's not an accurate way to view parareal even with a splitting. Even if we took out all the physical models, we're still in trouble. So here's one, one uh, this is sort of like a fact. Can I use an implicit solver for the course time step? So with these oscillations, what will turn out to be true, and I hope that I can convince you of this by the time I'm finished with the talk, um, implicit solvers certainly can be used to take big time steps, but they also cost you in terms of accuracy of the wave speeds. And for the nonlinear coupling in the PDE, you must get some of the wave speeds accurately. So in order to see speedups from parareal with it, using the coarse solver with an implicit method, you have to take small time steps anyway, and you wind up not realizing very much parallel speed up. Um, what about multigrid? Let's say I take, I take uh, a coarse resolution model in which I can take a bigger time step as my coarse solver. Well, if you do that, you also will not be resolving the some of the key wave frequencies that you need, and this also will not lead to parallel speedups. So um, you have to be careful with that too, and now I hope you're seeing that there are some aspects of this method that are very counterintuitive to what we've been doing for the last 50 years, I suppose. Um, so these disruptive algorithms need to be studied from scratch, and just to give you an example, if, if we do study them from scratch, we can rethink things like, how do we do data assimilation? So rather than doing some type of method where, where we are integrating forward and backward on you know, each time step or two with the data that we have, you can have a long string of time steps, and you can put the data in it. Instead of integrating forward and backward, you can just incorporate it into the iteration. So that's a completely different way of doing data assimilation than we do now. Um, what about the physics models? So if these physics models that I mentioned are introducing oscillations or dissipation in a way that we can't take into account with a parareal algorithm, this will completely slow down 
our parareal convergence. So some other strategy, if, if we were to go down this route, some other strategy would have to be uh, had for incorporating the physical models into the system. So it's, it's um, uh, my answer to the top question is probably not. Probably we shouldn't just apply parallel in time methods to, or at least parareal, to the models that we have now if we really want to consider how are we going to best make best use of these architectures of, of the future. So one of the things I thought when I heard Jean Cote giving his talk and when I was looking at uh, some of these unpublished papers is that there is no way this could possibly work for turbulence. So I'm going to show you right now some of the work of uh, these investigators here, Barry et al. They have several interesting papers. I'm just going to show you the results from one of their papers. This is an international team of people. Um, some of them are from U.S. laboratories, but also from France and, uh, I mean, around Europe. Um, they're using a data-driven, event-based course solver. And I don't have time to tell you about what they did. I'm trying to perk your interest in what they did. Um, so for them, they, their um, tasks for one iteration don't wait for the previous iteration to complete, but start as soon as the data is available. So here's, here are snapshots of their flow field. So this was for fully developed MHD turbulence and the snapshot of vorticity of a typical simulation is on the left, and I do idealized turbulent fluid mechanics, and this looks a lot like the vorticity I see in my fully turbulent simulations. And on the right is the Lyubinov exponent, showing that it is definitely fully developed turbulence. And now I'm going to show you the kind of parareal performance gains they have. Unfortunately, I don't know how it does to a, compared to a standard method, but this is some of their, uh, their results for strong scaling on the left, which has a fixed problem size, and you increase the number of processors, and weak scaling on the right, and I'm just going to talk about the strong scaling limit. You can see the weak scaling also tapers over, so they're not getting infinitely good speed-ups, but on the right for the strong scaling problem, they're getting factors of 30 over standard parareal by changing their course solver. Um, so uh, this is just an example of, of this counterintuitive idea that the parareal can do fully developed turbulence. Honestly, the turbulence is from um, a dissipative stiffness for which we know things about the long time behavior of the solution. So it, I don't think it's as hopeless as we think. So here we are back to these images of uh, dissipative stiffness and, a sti and oscillatory stiffness, and I've just showed you just a, a result that has more to do with the slow singular limit, this dissipative stiffness. And now I'm going to talk to you about the oscillatory stiffness, because this also is definitely not new. It's been with the numerical weather prediction community since the very beginning. This is this is our old friend um, from, from World War II, uh, from the very beginning of computing. So I have these great pictures of Ella Richardson and John von Neumann and Jewel Charney. Um, so I'm sure many of you know the story of Richardson. He, he had this idea that there should be a spherical building and then it should be filled with PhD students who would be writing calculations on pieces of paper and then doing message passing to each other to compute what was happening on the sphere. And his, his calculation um, was, it blew up. And then the community took some time to figure out exactly what that was. But when they, they so they knew about this, they knew that the, this, was, this was oscillatory stiffness. They knew about this, and Carl Rosby and John von Neumann were talking about how would they do this with the computer, and Carl Rosby said, well, you should talk to this hot young guy, Jewel Charney. And so they exchanged letters in which the slow dynamics, I don't think they thought about it this way then, but it was basically a fast 
singular limit. And Jules had deduced this intuitively from looking at weather maps. He deduced the slow equations from weather maps. And using these equations, uh, Jules and Phillips in 1953 had the first realistic numerical weather produced numerical weather prediction using these, it's called QG or quasi-geostrophy. I may say this later in the talk, but what I mean is the slow equations from a fast singular limit. So I would like to give you some intuition about the, the nonlinearity in, in, this, in this type of slow, fa slow um, fast singular limit type of dynamics. So I had tried this example out on Paul Woodward the other day, and I, and I thought it was good. So you're going to have to use your imaginations, though, because I don't have a plot for it. So think of the elastic pendulum. So just a spring on which there is a weight. And if you pull the weight down, the spring will start oscillating. And that is the fast mode. This in, in the atmosphere is thought of as the fast uh, inertia gravity waves, and it's oscillating like this. And then after some time period, it'll slowly start oscillating, and this is thought to be the same as the slow planetary waves, called Rossby waves. And then very slowly, it will start also, it'll go back to its oscillatory mode. So this is fast, and this is slow. But what else, another thing that happens, which is a slow type of dynamic, is that the pendulum mode processes in a circle. So it starts out swinging here, and on the next, and then it oscillates, and then it shifts this way, and then it oscillates, and then it shifts this way. So there's really careful nonlinear coupling between the fast and slow. So if you just average out these fast waves, you will get the slow, the slow pendulum mode, but you won't get the precession. So how to concoct a core solver in which you can also get the slow dynamics of the precession is part of our challenge with doing parareal for climate and weather prediction. So the, does the real atmosphere behave asymptotically? And by asymptotically, I mean is it, can we just approximate it with a pendulum? Do we have to keep track of these oscillations at all? Can we average them out? Can we use reduced equations like, like uh, Charney and Phillips? And this has been a topic of conversation in weather and climate for many years. I mean, since the beginning, but there was some important work done in the 70s and 80s. And so, Ed Lorenz and company wrote these papers that I just love, and every time I've been giving a talk recently, I mention them, and, I'll, and I will for you guys too, which is, uh, here's this 1986 paper on the existence of a slow manifold. Then, next, on the non-existence of the slow manifold. And last, the slow manifold, what is it? Right, so they, they weren't talking about the mathematics they were saying, they were wondering, is the atmosphere this way? And if so, what does the mathematics look like? And can we approximate it? And so this is one of, this is one of my major fluid dynamics interests, which is what led me to being interested in the parareal also. But I'll tell you that the dynamics is not asymptotic, and it is not accurate for for, so this, at, this asymptotic dynamics, it's not accurate for weather prediction and climate simulations. And so it isn't a slow manifold. I would say it's a non-invariant manifold, but it has some particular properties that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So I'm, I'm about to tell you about um, a locally asymptotic HMM. HMM is, means the heterogeneous multiscale method. I don't have time to talk about that either, but it's another vast subject of study in numerics um, that Terry Hout and I looked at using what we knew about the nature of the fast singular limits to try to make progress with the rotating shallow water equations. And so here, here I am, I, in my talk, I am now um, at this... Uh, 
where I'm going to give you some examples of the asymptotic parallel and time method. And um, I'm going to show some equations. This is typical set of equations. It's, it's a vector. This vector u has three components of velocity encapsulated in boldface v and a buoyancy or a temperature. And there are two terms, one that has to do with RO and one FR. These are Rosby and Froude. Don't worry about those. They're small parameters. And then the, there's a term on the right that has to do with dissipative stiffness. And I'm going to just... I've just collapsed it all now to a more abstract equation that just has a linear term with a 1 over epsilon and a dissipative term. Um, so this linear operator has oscillations on the time scale of order epsilon. If you want accurate wave frequencies, then your time step has to be order of epsilon. So you can do a coordinate transformation. You can say that um, there is another vector u. I think, I think my notation here is unfortunate because this isn't the same u and v as on the last slide. But think of these as two different, two different vectors of the solution field. And you do a coordinate transformation with a matrix exponential. When you do this, you've encapsulated all the fast waves in that operation, and you can see in this equation for V there are, no more, there are no more linear terms giving rise to the oscillation. Well, that's great, but if you take one more derivative with respect to time, they just crop up again. So this kind of strategy hasn't been that, um, that helpful. And I'm, I'm going to skip a few slides here and uh, get to this. So our asymptotic method depends on something that looks a lot like it. The leading order solution is a coordinate transformation acting on something smooth. So the thing that we take a big time step with a big coarse time step is this equation u bar on the bottom, where instead of taking the limit as tau to infinity, which would be the asymptotic limit, and I'm just going to go straight here, we approximate that limit. We say it's a finite time because we know that this epsilon hasn't, hasn't really gotten smaller and smaller. It's a finite number. In fact, in the atmosphere and ocean, it can be... In the ocean, it can be order one. It can be point one, but it's hardly ever super small. So here we go. I take the limit, I approx approximate it as the integral over a finite t-naught, and then as a sum. What I want you to notice is that when I do that, it is only the operator that gets summed, that is not the solution itself. So this, the sum is fully parallelizable by itself with a, just a gather-scatter kind of thing. And we're doing the time averaging on the operator, not the solution. Resolving the near-resonant frequencies appears to be really crucial for getting fast parareal convergence. And I put this slide in to try to give more intuition about why this is happening, but I, I think I need to move on and show you some other things first. So this is a, this is a um, plot of the averaging window of the nonlinear term. Each line is a different epsilon, so the blue one is epsilon um, uh, 1, green 0.1, red 0.01. So when we take the averaging window very long, for the red case, we're not getting any better um, number of iterations to solution. That's because we've already got the minimum. So I meant to say the, le the left-hand axis is the number of iterations to converge, like six decimal places or something. But you can see for these other epsilons, so I would say the red line is an, what we expect from asymptotics if the solution was behaving like the asymptotic solution. But the green one and blue one have minimums. So there is, a, there is an averaging window that will give us a minimum number of parareal iterations to converge. That's a signature of there being near resonances in the problem. So now I'm quickly going to give you some um, examples of our calculations for the one-dimensional shallow water equations, one-dimensional rotating sh shallow water equations. They've, the rotation is in, is in it in a very special way, so it's you know, like a slice 
uh, with a Gaussian initial condition, so it's a dam break. And this is an example of the fourth um, spectral coefficient of the height, so the shallow water has a height that moves up and down, and time is on the bottom. And the, our course time step for this problem is 0.3. So the solution for this fourth coefficient is oscillating wildly in between, and this is very common for oscillatory stiffness. Um, and I'm going to skip these and instead show you what the maximum relative error versus the number of iterations for this asymptotic this locally asymptotic parareal algorithm is. So um, it's the top figure I want you to look at. This is the one that has the most stiffness in it with epsilon 0.01. So the, the, the solid line is our parareal HMM asymptotic a pint thing. And you can see that the, how the, the log of the error is on the left-hand axis versus the number of total, iter total iterations, and this is a long string of course time steps, you know, like 1,200 time steps. Um, and we have standard parareal and the dashed lines, but, and for those cases, one of them is for the course time step three times, no, five times epsilon and the other four, but the solid line, we're doing 50 times. Okay. Anyway, we're, so we get, we get a factor of 100 in par parallel speed up. Um, and it's a factor of 10 over the standard parareal. I, ju I just want to do a few more things. So let's see, I'll skip this too. I'm going to go on to the exponential integrator because our parareal method depends on having a matrix exponential that is highly parallel. And we have con there's, there's, this has been studied for a long time too, but basically the nature of time stepping is a serial effort. You can see on the left, you do one time step at a time. You build up your solution over a long time step. You just apply this operator over and over again. But if you can use the matrix exponential, you can take a large one and the idea is, on the bottom left here, to approximate the matrix exponential as a highly parallelizable sum. So instead of, instead of building the time step up one time step at a time, you just, if you can take large time steps, you do a parallel sum, you, you do another gather and scatter. So I just want to show you the results for this for standard finite differences for different terms in this sum. This red line is uh, just Runge-Kutta. This is for the linear shallow water equations. Our parareal stuff was for the fully nonlinear case, but this is just for this exponential integrator. But you can see that we are getting, so that it's the number on the bottom axis is the number of cores um, for this Rexy uh, algorithm, we wind up getting a reduction in time to solution of 1,500 times faster than a regular Runge-Kutta time step. For spectral methods, it's more complicated, and there are a lot of ifs about how this is useful or not. Um, so I'll skip that too. Um, I think I will go straight to the end. Um, but my final thoughts, which is, so I've showed you, I've showed you a parareal method that at least for our simple equations can get super fast parallel speedups. For the cases we look at, you know, it's like a digit of accuracy per iteration, which, which um, I was really surprised about when I saw it. Um, it's easy to screw it up. We had to really be careful with how we treated the dissipative stiffness and the oscill oscillatory stiffness. So it's still a work in progress. Um, it's very counterintuitive. The Rexy thing is very counterintuitive. You're, you're, you're changing explicit operations into parallelizable operations, but each one of them requires a matrix solve. You know, if I, if I had suggested this to my thesis advisor, you know, he would have thought that I was crazy. But you saw yourself that there's a huge 
reduction in wall clock time. So it's, I, f I find this process to be counterintuitive. The, the, when we decided to try Parareal, we hadn't realized that it was also going to open the door to all kinds of other parallelism. The averaging of the nonlinear operator is parallel. The, um, the Rexy is parallel all by itself. So all these could add up to other types of parallelism. So, um, you know, what does this mean for us if we can really get the runs independent of the time step? If we can, they're not really independent of the time step because you're doing fine time steps in between, you're just doing them faster. Um, what could we do with asynchronous computing? So one of my colleagues suggested, what if you, what if you throw all the right-hand sides at the GPUs and you, and you throw 10 times as many as you need to, and then you don't put in any wait till it's done? So this is almost like a probabilistic kind of idea for convergence on a time string that is almost... When Mark was talking about the architectures and how the power will fluctuate on the cores and how, they, and how they're going to run, this is almost commensurate with the unknown, an unknown like that. So I, I don't know. We haven't done this yet. I'm just trying to share with you the possibilities that could open up if this is pursued. Um, there's also things to be done with fault tolerance. If you're doing slices of things iteratively, you can imagine if a bunch of cores go down, you could reconstruct the solution in one place if you wanted to. And, and uh, Daniel Ruprecht at Leeds has tried things like this already. So I also wanted to, my final thing, my final thing to say is um, I think I would like to challenge people to attempt to do calculations like this, even with just simple, ordinary differential equations, because you may find uh, also that there are counterintuitive ideas to consider, which is, from, from my perspective, you know, we've known things about the asymptotic solutions of these types of equations for a long time, but we've never actually made use of them in our, at least for climate and weather, like I think we might. So, okay, I'm done. Thank you.